Today's date is Wednesday, April 19th, 2023. The time is 1.05 p.m. My name is Landon Hatch, Marie Golisano Graham Outreach Archivist in the RIT Archives, and I am interviewing Ann Costello, Executive Director of the B. Thomas Golisano Foundation at their office in Victor, New York. Ann has been a stakeholder and key collaborator in the development of the B. Thomas Golisano Collection and Golisano Outreach Program in the RET Archives, and recently announced her retirement for June 2023 after 23 years of leadership at the Golisano Foundation. As we get going, Ann, may I just have your verbal consent to record this interview? You have my consent. Perfect. Thank you. So let's start, let's start at the very beginning. Um, tell us about your journey to the nonprofit sector. Well, um, I don't know that it was unusual, but after undergrad, I worked four years before deciding to go back to grad school. And when I did, I knew I wanted to do something in the public social policy arena. I always leaned towards human service, um, but I never wanted to be in direct service. It was always around the policy aspect of human service and social issues. So I went back to grad school, University of Pennsylvania, got my master's in um, social policy and practice, they call it. I had a research fellowship at the School of Urban and City Planning, so it was kind of a nice um, mesh or integration of the human service, social justice with communities and community at the time, community development block grants were a big thing in the, with the federal government. So we were researching them and seeing what if they were effective. Came back to Rochester and started my career, a 15 year career at the United Way of Greater Rochester. So do you want me to keep going yeah. with what that was? Yeah. Okay. Um, I started as a research associate, which was a perfect entree into getting to know the community of greater Rochester. So it was Monroe and the surrounding counties, contiguous counties to Monroe was the geographic target area. And from a research associate, I moved up and over to the allocation or fund distribution side. I was never a campaigner. I never asked anybody for money. A lot of people think when they think of United Way, they think about the campaigns. But I always think people should think about what did you do with the money that I contributed? And that was the side of the house that I was always on. for, And I was there for 15 years. Loved my work at United Way. Um, their reach was tremendous, everything from soup to nuts, early childhood to senior citizens, rural communities in um, the heart of downtown Rochester. I had a wonderful staff team of about six or seven. I had hundreds of volunteers, which really made for rich discussions and um, decision making with the distribution of the money. I ended my 15-year career there as the, at the time, I guess it was called the Director of Community Investment. It used to be Director of Allocations, um, and they changed it to in Community Investment, that we were actually allocating or distributing the dollars to invest in community issues and problems. So it was a very rewarding career. I loved my work. And so you mentioned coming back to Rochester. Mm -hmm. You grew up in this community? I grew up about an hour outside of Rochester in a rural county of Wayne County. Okay. I'm actually a proud 315-er. <laughs> it's the area code. <laughs> and then went to Buff State, Buffalo State for my undergrad degree. And then four years later went to UPenn. And so, you know, how was that different for you, you think, um, serving a community that was you know relevant to your sort of upbringing versus serving a community that might have you know you might have transferred into or translocated you know it's interesting that coming from a Clyde my hometown was about 2,500 people very tiny very rural it, but yet I always wanted to go to the city whatever that meant to an 18 year old and for me Buffalo was that city 
and I loved it. I thrived. I, I took advantage of what Buffalo at the time had to offer, the Buffalo Bills. They had a, this Buffalo Sabres. They, they had a basketball team, the Braves. I mean, it was really an exciting time. They had um, the odd. Everybody had an odd. Every city, you know, concert scenes and, and education. I, you know, it, I'm a product of the state school, at least for my undergrad, and I thought I got a great education. So I always wanted to, I don't know if I thought that that's where policy and human service intersect. Maybe I thought it was a higher level than at the, the, the ground level of a farm community. I don't know. Again, you're 18 years old, you don't know. But I knew I wanted to be in the, in the urban area, bigger. Um, that was my goal, and I was able to do it. Then moved to Rochester after undergrad and took a job, took several jobs, Boys and Girls Club, Grease Youth Services, all in human service. And then after about four years, I said, um, it's time to go back. I've learned, I've seen enough, I have some hands-on experience, and Penn seemed to offer the type of program that I was interested in. And so, you know, you're 18, you're young, you're really early. Did you envision your career trajectory, sort of always working your way up that ladder? It's, it's a very good question. I always tell people, and especially younger professionals, I did not go to college to become the executive director of a foundation like the Golisano Foundation. So it's um, a classic life journey that you might, you don't really know where you're going. I certainly had a passion. I certainly had a direction, and I was fortunate in, in that. I know some people, it might take a little longer to find that passion, but mine was um, apparent to me pretty early on in my, um, my youth and my, my college career. But again, I um, could have never, I never, I never even knew what the United Way was. So I would have never said, yeah, I'm going to work at the United Way. I didn't know what family foundations were. So um, no, I never saw myself. <laughs> I knew I could be a leader. I knew I wanted to, um, if leader means make a difference and make change. My dad, um, watched his generation as all that all of them did the the demonstrations in the 60s late 60s and i was on the tail end of that but knew many people that were right in the thick of things and my father said they're they're missing an important point or part of the demonstration he said well it's important for the voices to be heard if you want to make change, real change, you have to be on the inside and work out. So you take that voice, you take that passion, and you work inside those institutions and systems, if you will, that, that can make the change for whatever cause or whatever social justice issue uh, matters to you. And it's a lot of work. It's hard work. It, you have to be patient with it can be frustrating in that regard, that it takes takes such time. So how did you make your way from the, the United Way to the Golisano Foundation? Well, I um, everybody's heard of the sandwich generation, and I was a young sandwich. I had an 85-year-old mother with a 5-year-old son. So um, I tried to make it work on both ends with a mother who was becoming uh, more frail and a son who's active and starting school. And the United Way was wonderful with all kinds of arrangements and flexibilities, but being the, the head of the department and, and, and a big and busy department, at some point I said, I, I can't do it all. Something's got to give. And at this point in my life, it's not my family. 
it was hard to leave because I loved my work, but it, I have no regrets and no, I didn't have second thoughts. So I went home. I had not been home in, well, at that point, probably almost 20 years, <laughs> 15 at United Way and other jobs before. And it took a while to adjust, but we were so busy with my mother's doctor's appointments that, and she was still out in Clyde, so that was an hour drive back and forth. My son was in half-day kindergarten. He'd get home, we'd get in the car, we'd go to Nana's. So that worked for a while, and, and slowly but surely, I actually started to get into a rhythm of his life as a, as a young five-year-old, or five-year-old. And then, lo and behold, the, the fall, next summer, that was in the fall, fall of 1998, Right. So about a year, the following July, um, Tom Golisano's office called my home phone because we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> or maybe they were just on the scene. I don't know. The home phone and said that Tom Golisano would very much like for me to come over and talk with him. I think they must have said about his foundation because I, I, I can't believe they would have just said, Tom Golisano would like you to come over and talk to him. So I didn't know he had a foundation. I didn't know what that meant. Um, I wasn't sure I was even interested in going, to be honest with you, because I, I didn't know what his foundation meant. And I didn't know Tom. He wasn't very active in United Way as a volunteer. So... I didn't have that kind of interaction or knowledge about him. Um, but I went, and I um, actually, my husband encouraged me to go because, like I said, it was summertime and I was finally enjoying <laughs> having some time off, right? Um, but I went, and he described, I'll never forget, he said to me, I want to grow my philanthropy. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he, he literally said, I don't know, but I want to grow my philanthropy. There's a lot more I want to do, and there's a lot to be done. So at the time, the foundation, his foundation was about 3 to $5 million, which 5% of that, if you just do the, the round numbers, um, $250,000 distribution. Well, I was used to almost $30 million at United Way and 350 agencies in six counties. So as he's talking, I said to him, you know, I, I would consider this if, if you think um, I could be helpful to you. I said, but what you described to me is a part-time job. I don't know if that's why we hit it off or not, but um, that's what I said. What he did describe was a part-time job. I had my mother and my son in the back of my head still, but I was intrigued by our conversation. After Tom and I met, I was interviewed by uh, his board of directors. There were only three or four members because, again, like many family foundations, when they first start, they're kind of um, kitchen table, very um, informal, and not that it was disorganized, but they don't have a lot of policies and procedures. So, but there were three or four trustees. I met with them, and then I was offered the position and started October 1st of 1999. And so for about six or seven years, I was part-time. And I focused exclusively on the family foundation, the Golisano Foundation, whose primary and sole mission is to support programs and people with intellectual disabilities. Because Tom has a family member with ID, and that was why the foundation was set up in the first place. Then after six or seven years, Tom started to grow that philanthropy that he talked about in our first meeting. 
and asked if I could take on some more projects and work with him on his personal philanthropy. And so if you think about Tom's philanthropy, there's the Family Foundation for Intellectual Disabilities, and then there's his personal philanthropy, which includes things like Golisano Children's Hospitals, RIT, College of Computing Science, Golisano's Institute of Sustainability at RIT, and a myriad of other projects around town and in Southwest Florida. And to date, I can tell you that in my 23 years here, we went from that $250,000 when I started part-time to now close to $350 million. And it's been one heck of a, a ride and career. Wonderful. Great opportunity and a lot of fun. A lot of hard work, but a lot of fun. So I want to backtrack um, just a little bit. Getting mm-hmm. that sort of cold call from Tom, is that typical of him to just sort of do that? Well, um, good question because um, it, it was a cold call, but somebody had suggested he call me. Some, a volunteer that I had worked with at United Way knew Tom, and uh, apparently Tom had been talking about I need some help with my foundation, with my grant making, my grant distribution. And somebody said, this person, well, why don't you call Ann Costello? That I, She did this at United Way. I worked closely with her, and you might want to meet her and, and see what you think. So it was, yes, it was, but no, it wasn't. Gotcha. It was a recommendation of, of somebody that we both knew. Gotcha. And you said, you know, you guys hit it off. Um and with it being a part-time position, what was your first impression of him? Well, you know, he had a reputation at the time um, that he was a very strict CEO at Paychex. He had built the company. It was quite obviously very successful. But he, as a, as a manager, as a CEO person, had a reputation of um, being pretty rigid with um, dress code and decorum in the office. Like, for instance, at that time, the women in the office at Paychex, this is 1998, still wore skirts and stockings. And I hadn't worn skirts and stockings <laughs> in a number of years at United Way. I still dressed professionally, but we had been in pants suits for, for quite some time, quite a few years. So th- that's what I knew about Tom, because everybody thought that was Tom Golisano, but believe me, there's a lot more to Tom Golisano than than strict dress codes, which ultimately did change, and he changed (laughs) with the times and with his employees who said, suggested that things change. So I was hesitant for two reasons. One, I still had my mother, my 85-year-old and my 5-year-old, and for the first time in nearly 18 years, I was enjoying a summer not working. So I thought, am I ready for this? But boy, am I so glad I, I went and had the chat because my husband, as my husband said, you don't have to say yes. You First of all, you don't even know. He may not want you to work with him. And um, so just, I guess that's the first lesson. Don't ever pass up an opportunity for, um, you know, to talk with somebody who might have something you want to do. Because you never have, you don't have to take it. But if you don't talk to him, you'll never know. And so you mentioned, you know, the difference with the Family Foundation and some of those early kitchen table conversations. Who were some of those early um, colleagues that you had? They were his trustees, his friends, um, Again, typical of a family foundation, you surround yourself with um, people you trust, with anybody, everybody does that. Mm -hmm. But when a family foundation starts, you not only do you look at their skill, but their relationship to you, because it's a very personal thing when someone starts a family foundation. So you hope that your advisors, your trustees, will be making decisions with the founder's mission, ideas, um, values in mind. It's 
sometimes I say it's more of an art than a science, and it's um, a kind of a package deal when it comes to motivation, the motivations in a family foundation. So his trustees included um, his first wife, Gloria Austin, who is the mother of his children, um, the former CFO of Paychex, Tom Clark, who, by the way, was the first banker that gave Tom a loan. And Tom nabbed him from the bank and brought him over to Paychex to be the first CFO, or maybe not the first CFO, but CFO. So he was on the, um, the board. And Jim Murray, who was the partner on the Paychex account, who did the audit, um, he was with Ernst & Young at the time when Paychex went public. So he obviously trusted Jim Murray very much. And I, I don't know if there was another one or not. I'm blanking. You know, Tom had one other staff person. In, involved before I started, David Still. So prior to me coming on board, a year prior, Tom had been talking to someone about his growing empire. Um, paychecks was taking off. Um, he had his family, his grandchildren, properties. Um, he, it, it was a lot to manage. And somebody said, well, what, what you're describing is um, a family office. You need to establish a family office. And Tom said, what's a family office? And somebody who he was having lunch with said, there's a, a relatively new fellow in town, David Still, who used to work in Pittsburgh for the Heinz family. And David was with a bank, local bank, and he was a banker, but he he also, he had this role with the Heinz family. So David and Tom met, and David explained what a family office is and what he did for the Heinz family. And before the lunch was over, Tom asked him if he wanted the job to help him establish the family office. So he asked about these cold calls, but they happen. <laughs> they might be cold, but then it's based on relationship and whether or not you connect. And Tom's a pr very good judge of character and that connection. Um, and it either does or it doesn't. Um, so David thought about it, and the, he came on board. So he was there a year before I did. He managed and handled for Tom everything exclusive of the um, philanthropy. So then I came on board, and we were a two-person shop. So you come on board. You're given this directive to grow my philanthropy. What did those first couple years on the job look like for you? The directive wasn't to me to grow the philanthropy. Tom was going to grow his philanthropy. I needed to establish some policies and procedures for how to distribute and determine who will receive the funds. So I, it was starting from scratch. I, don't, I think they had a P.O. box. I don't really even know how they got applications to that kitchen table. But again, that's typical of a family foundation, a fairly new one. And so I put on my you know, experience from United Way. And it, interesting, Tom said, Ann, you can put together all the policies and procedures that you want to keep us organized. He said, but I don't need to know about them. He said, I'll, I need to know certain information about organizations that are requesting funds, but I am not going to get in the weeds of what should be on the application and how often you're going to get the... So that was just, you know, he hires people to do the job they're hired to do. I always said this could never have been a first job for me or I don't think for anybody because of that. He hires you to do the job. He was not going to supervise or mentor or guide me through establishing the operational side of a family foundation. He needed someone to come in and do that. And 
thank goodness I had 15 years of experience so that I could. So he was growing his philanthropy. I went from the 3 million to the 6 million to the, he's, he's adding resources now to the foundation, 15 million, 25 million, and we got up to, I mean, that was over those six years. So we went from a handful of agencies to, you know, a dozen or more every quarter, and they're getting more substantial in size and scope. This foundation today is, you know, a lot depends on the stock market, of course, but it's about $60 million now. And we give out $3 million a year compared to, you know, when we were not even a million when we started. So just to sort of lend transparency to people who might not be familiar with, you know, nonprofits or even, you know, nonprofit leadership, as you see it, what is the role of the executive director? Well, the role of a executive director of a family foundation is first and foremost to be sure that you are you are um, honoring the values, principles, and interests of the founder and the family. This is not my foundation. It doesn't matter if I don't think intellectual disabilities should be the priority or not. It is the family's priority. And that is first and foremost. It is not for me to encourage them to broaden that. It's not in, to me to bring information about all the other needs in the world. There's, a, there's plenty of needs in the world. This is their niche. This is their passion. So as that executive director, not only do I have to be educated in the field to bring them um, potential applicants, partners, opportunities, but I have to work with those who are supporting people with intellectual disabilities, not only to make sure our money is put to good use, but that we are delivering the best service through those partners for people with intellectual disabilities. So um, I promote our mission. I, that's for a couple of reasons, to educate those that do not know this issue and its importance, its challenges, its needs. And I do it to um, educate other providers that we're here and this is what, what we stand for and what we're interested in. On the operational side, of course, I need to know that not-for-profits have all their paperwork in order, that they're legit 501, approved 501c3s, that they have audited financial statements, that finances, this is all part then of the grant-making process that goes on behind the scenes before it gets to Tom and the board. That's the job of the executive director and the staff here. To, to manage all of that. The job is to represent Tom and the foundation in, in the community and in the public arena. But again, it's about the, the family mission and, and values that drive this foundation. And can I ask, you know, when you say family, I know we've got Tom, we've got Gloria Austin, what other family members are sort of in your orbit? Um, well, let, let's be distinct, make the distinction. A family foundation is a legal, um, philanthropic, not for profit. So he established the trust as a family foundation, as opposed to, for instance, a community foundation. So I keep saying family foundation because, well, it is a family foundation and it was legally structured that way. So we aren't um, beholden to the community. We have to follow the rules, don't get me wrong, but it's different. But to your question specifically, um, Gloria is, has retired from the board. She lives out of town, and it became difficult for her to go back and forth, although we, she still receives all the information and is very much um, up to date on our activities. 
we have um, a trustee, the, um, Tom's nephew, Chuck Graham, who is on the board of trustees. And we're so glad to have him because obviously he grew up with Tom. There is that bond. There is similarities. And if anybody knows Tom and what drives him, it's Chuck. So we have one family member. And then we have um, his grandniece who works at the foundation as well and helps us process the grants and get them ready for board consideration. You know, it's interesting when we did a strategic planning session after the 30th anniversary. So that would be um, almost 10 years ago. Tom, we were, Tom was asked, is, do you require a family member to be on the board of trustees at all times? And he, he declined that. He encouraged future trustees and the entity to, to include family members, but he did not want to in, require it. And I think that's because you just never know where families are going to live and what they're going to be doing and how many, who, who the different generations. But it would be nice to always have some thread of family through through the work of the foundation. So you touched a little bit on um, what you know drives Tom and his interest for creating this, but you know, on the other side of that, what what drives you? What's kept you here for these twenty three years? What resonates with you? Well, this is going to sound like one of my speeches, and it's not, um, but. I, I don't know. I guess I can take some credit for um, coining the our tagline, imagine the possibilities. I work for a man that imagines the possibilities. Tom does not see obstacles. Tom sees opportunities. And oftentimes he... If something's wrong or going awry, he, he finds a better way. You know, we we just keep our eye on the target and we we work till till it's where we think it needs to be. Now, can we fix everything? Do we work on absolutely not. But when we undertake a project, we undertake an issue, we we see the opportunities, we imagine the possibilities and it's been I mean, I cannot imagine working for any other philosophy or person and I've been so fortunate that I I have had 23 years working with him or for a man that looks at the world that way um, no there's very few roadblocks here in terms of you know vision and opportunity now he's he approaches his philanthropy like he does businesses it's very business like Um, No, everybody, you know, the saying goes, what happens to those business people when they walk into a not-for-profit boardroom? They sort of take off their business hats. Well, Tom never takes off his business hat. And for any proposal, it has to be well-organized. Their financials have to be solid. The plan has to be solid. They have to have a track record and the capacity and wherewithal to reach their vision or goals. So it's it's very rigorous and it's very businesslike. And I admire him for that. And I think the organizations that come before him do as well. Because they know in the end if it was successful, it's quite the stamp of approval. Not just the, the benefit of the financial resources, but that Galasano thought this was a worthy endeavor. And it many bear his name. And how have you defined um, success in your career? What have been some of your proudest achievements? Well, the one that comes to mind first is the Special Olympics International Healthy Community Project initiative. 
there's this backstory about that. That was 10 or 12 years ago. The, the grant cycle, the grant was announced in 2012 at Clinton Global Initiative. But we had been talking with Special Olympics two or three years prior to that. I, I think people don't understand that when they see the headline, Golisano awards X million to Special Olympics. I, I actually get calls from people or organizations that say, well, how do I get in line for one of those? They don't realize that it's two to three years in the making, first of all. Um, but around that time, I had been here 10, 10, 12, maybe going on 15 years. I wasn't, I was, you know, maturing in age. And I said to myself, hmm, everybody in their mid-50s does this, so get ready. You'll say, what do I want to do with the rest of my professional career? Do I want to stay here? And if I don't, because there's something else, if I'm going to make a move, it needs to be fairly soon. So I wasn't looking, but again, when the, the clock starts to tick, you start to ask yourself, is this where I'm going to be? Lo and behold, at the same time, then the Special Olympics International Project came to us. We worked on it. We funded it. And it was like I had a whole new job. So I didn't need to leave. And I'm glad I didn't need to leave because it has taken me not only physically to places around the world I never would have gone to, but the impact, the improved health outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities all over the world has just been unbelievable. And um, I am so proud of that work and so happy and glad that Tom took a chance. It was his first international global gift. Um, but we, he believed that if anybody could do it, it would be Special Olympics. They're not a health organization, but their reach to those who could partner with them and us to improve health um, was very strong, and it proved to be right, that they were the right organization to create this, as Tim Shriver says, the inclusion revolution. And as far as in, in the Golisano realm, it's health, inclusive health revolution. So that's one of them. Um, the other, I would say, is the Golisano Pediatric Behavioral Health Center and the Golisano Autism Center. I was at with those projects from the very beginning. Why those are so meaningful for many reasons. One, pediatric adolescent behavioral health and autism five or so years ago, was ex the needs were exploding. And there had been talk and there had been proposals and plans and and it all started to come together, and the partners were right, and the uh, momentum was right, and the we made it happen at a very important time in the service needs of people in our families in our region. So I am very proud of that, um, both of them, and they're connected. There's a building in the middle called the Connector. It's a cafe between the Pediatric Behavioral Health and the Autism Center because many of the young people, the, the clients are the same. But also it's all about shared resources, being smart about space and um, learning from each other. So that one is way up there in my, my proudest moments. And can I ask, conversely to that, you know, what have been some of the biggest challenges or most difficult lessons that you've had to learn throughout your career? Well, if you think back to how we started this conversation, I said I wanted to be at the systems level, the policy level. Well, it didn't take long for me to realize that in the world of intellectual disabilities, you're dealing with state and federal governments and Medicaid reimbursements that are typically very low for providers. And it is such a massive system of regulations and rules and silos. As important as the Golisano 
foundation philanthropy dollars are. We are such a, a small fish in this very large pond. So the challenges have always been to try to navigate those systems that the state and government put on providers serving people with IDD and finding the best use of our small but very important dollars in this large, massive bureaucratic system. And the government moves so slowly that um, it can be very frustrating to, you know, make some gains. We, we demonstrate successes in areas that maybe they haven't funded yet, and then they do. That's good, but it, it takes a long time. I've learned to, to be very patient, but I've also learned to not give up. And I've also learned to find the right people, the partners that can help move, or at least help to move it um, faster or smarter than you certainly can by yourself. So that's been a challenge. The other is that um, the world is not a kind place oftentimes. It's a, it can be hard for everyone for different reasons. But when you have a child, a loved one, a family member with an intellectual disability, we're trying to build an, an inclusive community in society, but, but people with IDD are still marginalized, still ridiculed, still thought of as less, still have difficulty accessing needed services. It is a hard life. You know, when I go to meetings, all of us sitting around trying to figure out what do we do with our money or how do we help families in, in this particular arena? Or I, I leave the meeting. I start and I leave the meeting by saying, after these hour, two hours, d did we do anything that really helped a family? You know, because meetings, you meet and you meet and you meet. I really try to remember at the end of the day why I do this work and what my work is about. And it's about families and individuals, the human being at the end of the end of the line, which I think really should be at the beginning. And, you know, as you're working through that, some of those frustrations and whatnot um, throughout your career, you know, what has your personal and professional support network looked like? Well, I have a wonderful board of trustees and can call them anytime, before and after meetings, to, to debrief or to get their take to help me be prepared. I have a great, small but mighty staff team, and the same. We debrief, we're candid, we're open. We can, we can have our bad days, and it's okay. And we can call each other out on things, and, and it's okay. Outside of the office, I float around in, there is an organization called um, the New York State Funders Alliance. It used to be called Rochester Grant Makers, but now it's uh, more regional and actually at Albany and up. So the, the different territories, you know, collaborated and formed one. And that's um, foundations, whether it be family foundations, corporate foundations, or community foundations. And they have um, webinars and virtual lunches for the like type organizations. So over the years, certainly, again, if you, you can attend the, those um, meetings of the Alliance or, you know, you pick up the phone. So, yeah, we're a pretty close group locally and I've been at this a long time so I do have people colleagues that I've worked with for years you know I don't know if everybody knows but funders do share information I mean not confidential information but information that could help them in their grant making so we if they have experience with a particular provider or in a particular arena we don't Maybe we're, we're more siloed than we like to think we are, but, but we do communicate and share 
and have a collegial a camaraderie that I think is very important in this business. You know, it's people, I, I always hear from the fundraisers, gee, I wish I was on the other side of the fence. I wish I was over there giving out the money instead of asking for people to donate the money. Very different. I get that. It's not easy to give out the money. And we say no quite a few times because we have to. There isn't enough to go around or it, it's not quite fitting the mission or it's not quite as developed the way we need it to be. It, it's hard to, everybody has a cause. Everybody's cause is good, I'll say that. Is it appropriate for the Golisano support? Not all the time. And we do have to make choices. We do have to make choices. That's a challenge too. Um, so women employees make up a significant percentage of the nonprofit sector, but they're still, I think, significantly underrepresented in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Well, leadership at the, the CEO level, I will say, I think has improved tremendously. When I was at United Way, I, I could probably count on one hand the number of females that were the CEOs of the not-for-profits funded by the United Way at the time. So again, almost 40 years ago. I think many, and, and now those CEOs maybe were the associate directors, or a program director at, at some level in the organization, or left one to be the other. Um, board, um, I don't know. I think board are improving as well um, because, you know, women now, lawyers are 50 50, ba bankers die. I, I mean, I think there's improvement. I think there's improvement, definitely. Um, I don't know that we'll ever, I don't know, what, what's the perfect world that we're representative of the, the proportions we are, I, that's one metrics. Um, I don't know if I answered that question. You did. Um, so related to that and sort of change and evolution over time, how, is, how have you noticed the Valisano Foundation has changed in your 23 years? I know we talked about, you know, increasing... Um, Resources, yeah. right. Um, well, from a operational standpoint, we expanded territory. We... When OPW, that's the state agency that funds people with intellectual disabilities, changed their um, regions. We used to be um, Genesee region, and Buffalo was Western region. We all they merged us into Region One, so there was a decision by the board then that we would adopt that and expand to the Western counties. So that was a big, big move for us. Because I didn't, I at the time I was still the only staff person, and um, as a matter of fact, I've been the only staff person for twenty of those twenty-three years. <laughs> My two staff are, have been here three years. Don't ask me how. Don't ask me why. It's just. It's just what it is. So we took on Western New York, and that is when I did get a staff person. And then Tom became a resident of Florida, so we added Southwest Florida in, in terms of eligibility, and we defined that as Sarasota and South. So um, we do have a grant process there as well. Um, we've expanded the board as we um, got larger. As we added territory and as trustees age, it, it, we needed um, new blood, we needed new skills. So our, I believe our um, trust said we would have six trustees and then you have to go through a legal process and we grew it to nine. So we 
realized that we needed to grow in that respect. Um, how else have we changed? We certainly haven't changed in mission. That, that will never change. As a matter of fact, we were talking at a board meeting, not a formal, very informal, about, because Tom has so many interests outside of the foundation, and it was an informal conversation about would, would we ever incorporate any of those into the foundation? Now, who knows? Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But at the time, it was pretty clear that he's very happy with the focus of the foundation. It's pretty pure and on serving those with intellectual disabilities. Now, you know, the future is another day. But um, we, the mission wasn't always so clear. We did work on that. When I first came, for the first two to three years as a new person, I didn't want to write the mission or interject. So I'd go to the our quarterly meetings and... I'd listen to why, Tom in particular, why he didn't think something that came to the foundation um, fit our mission. If you read our mission, you, you could make a case that it did because many mission statements are written quite generally and ours was as well. So two or three years in, I suggested that we tighten it up because I made the list of everything that was denied, everything that was funded, and it was very clear that intellectual disabilities was going to, is the focus, not disabilities in a more general sense. So anyway, um, you tighten up, you, you look at yourself, you make sure you're where you want to be with your grant making process based on, you know, the founders wishes and you have to check that every once in a while can I ask in your experience because you mentioned you know the mission of the foundation is really pure and um, just you know knowing that the founder has um, a family member with intellectual disabilities is that pretty common for you know founders to have that very personal connection with their cause yeah I think it is a personal connection and or passion so um absolutely think of special olympics that was because of intellectual disabilities um many of them the founder um, starts it because of that i think what's interesting about tom and for people to understand this is i find this remarkable he was a young dad we can go back and do the math because it, it was a, um, legally incorporated in 1985 with $90,000. Now, how, I think he was 45, give or take. How many 45-year-olds take $90,000 and establish a foundation? Not many at all. What I really need to ask him is, obviously he had all the confidence in the world in paychecks, but I'm not sure he knew how successful it was going to be. But he was committed to helping in any way, at any level he could, other families that had a family member with IDD. So I, I just find that to be a, a wonderful legacy, an important part or dimension to his story that however small it was in, in its beginning, and however big it's, it has grown to and will grow to, it started by the 45-year-old man and $90,000. Pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. So, obviously it's never an easy decision, but how did you decide that this was the right time for you to retire? You know, I um, again, when you when you start to get a certain age, you start to to just think about would I, could I, should I, and and I've heard I'm not alone in this that you walk up to it over a few years. It's not something you think about every day. It's not 
you know, I'm not obsessed with it, but you do start to think about it. And then COVID happened in my case. I don't know that COVID prolonged or um, prevented me from making the announcement, but I was, everybody, including myself, we were so absorbed with what to do, how to do it, get the grant dollars out during the pandemic because so the needs were, were different, but just as great, and in some cases greater. No, families didn't have the, the technology for um, telemedicine therapy sessions and Mary Cariola laptops for their children. For, so anyway, we were scrambling. And then we're, we've come out of it. I, I have to say, I think things are different than they were when we went in. And I know everybody says that, and I don't mean it to be cliche but it is different. People are still finding their sea legs. People, I think, are still um, being cautious. Resources are were tight. They're, they're afraid of another, that, not that a pandemic's on the horizon, but they, they got caught with um, limited resources. So they're not thinking as far ahead. They're maybe not as thinking of new projects. It's just different. It's just different. And I just said, you know what? It's time. And I picked June 2nd because my life has been quarterly meetings for 23 years. If I waited till the July quarter, I might as well wait till the end of the year because I missed the summer. So April, next week is my last board meeting. I have a month to clean up and finish up, and then I'm retiring. So I'll have my first summer in upstate New York, which is glorious. First one in 40-plus years. I'm looking forward to it. Not an easy decision to get to, but like everybody says, you'll, you know when it's time. And when I, Tom and I talked, it, it was definitely time. So no second thoughts and no regrets. And how do you want your time at the foundation to be recognized? Well, you know, the, it sounds like a cliche, but it's so me. Um, I was doing my job, and I hope it's recognized as a good job. We worked hard, and I say we, trustees, Tom, and my community partners. You don't do this alone. Um, you know, in the philanthropy business, we, we, we now have realized that the money is s the start of the process, not the end game. It used to be write a check, good luck, thank you very much. Now it's, okay, I'm investing in this money, and there is a lot of work to do. And I've been fortunate enough that providers have let me work with them side by side as, as partners. So I hope, I hope that that's how I'm remembered, that um, she worked alongside of us. And together we were trying to improve life poor families and people with IDD. And what advice do you have for your successor in doing their job? I learned over the years that there's always going to be more to do and not enough resources, time to do it. So really feel good, celebrate what you can accomplish, celebrate those successes, and keep, keep moving, keep moving. So I'd like to shift at this point a little bit and talk okay. about your relationship to Tom. And so, you know, one of the things that we've talked about at length is sort of how to best represent the multiple facets of his identity um, in the RIT Archives collection. But I wanted to ask on a personal level, you know, how do you navigate your relationship to Tom as such an incredibly multifaceted individual? Uh, 
I, I'll start by saying I, I think I, I know. I've had the benefit of working with him when he was on a mission. So I'm fortunate in that regard. And that mission was, as we started this conversation, to grow his philanthropy and in IDD as well as his other interests in higher ed, in children's health, and, and other things. So we worked, we had to work very closely together in order for him to accomplish those goals and for me to help him accomplish. I learned that earlier in the, our conversation, I said this could never have been a first job for me or anyone, and, and I mean it in this regard. I learned from working early on with Tom that every no that I received, whether it be on a proposal or a meeting or a, I, I don't know what, an issue, I was getting closer to the yes. But if I thought, oh my gosh, he doesn't like anything I'm bringing to him or I'm a failure or I don't know what this man wants, but he, he can articulate is this gut what he doesn't want. And I was able to quickly learn that we were getting closer to yeses. I, I'm a good listener. So I could hear, you know, when proposals used to come in without financial statements. That sounds like an easy one now. But in the beginning, don't even think you're going to talk to Tom Golisano without a financial statement. So I learned those things. And I guess we learned to work together. I, we tease each other because we're different people. You know, he always says, oh, here she comes. So that means I'm going to spend some money. Um, or he thinks, um, you know, I, I have a, a bigger heart and he thinks with his head. But, you know, you put the two together and we, I think we've, we've made it work. I've enjoyed it. I hope he, I think he has too, trusted my, my guidance and advice to him as a, a confidential advisor. And um, it's been interesting, to say the least. He is multifaceted. And people, I love when people think they know Tom Golisano because they might know one facet of that personality. But he's many. He's the businessman. He's the, the thinker. He's the human calculator. He's a father of a son with disabilities. He's a husband. I mean, he has many facets to his life, as we all do. But I, obviously the, the public one is, you know, Tom Golisano, the successful entrepreneur. Those people who think they know Tom, what do you think that the public would find most surprising about him? That he's pretty down to down to earth, and he um, never forgets his roots and his hometown upbringing. I think you experienced that with him sitting out on the picnic table when you first came over to meet him, right? It's just regular, regular folk. He prefer he would prefer to have a hot dog out at the picnic table than you know a fancy meal in a restaurant it, interesting when um he's um when we're he is doing a ribbon cutting or a grand opening or or an announcement or whatever i can't tell you how many organizations and institutions have asked me if he will be coming with a driver never <laughs> he drives himself everywhere I say just have a cone so he can park up close so he doesn't have to, you know, search the parking lot for a, a spot. But no, he will not be coming with a driver. So he's a pretty regular guy in that regard. I don't know if everybody knows that because they only see the public right. when he's in an event or being recognized or whatever. And how would you characterize his philanthropic legacy?
Well, I'm at a um, certainly in a, a unique position and perspective. I think his legacy will be one of transformation. What he has done in our region and now in Southwest Florida is pretty unprecedented. And um, again, it depends on who you'd ask because some are will know him and remember his legacy as he cared for sick children. Others will say, thank goodness for the autism center. Others, of course, intellectual disabilities. Others, well, RIT, I think it was the first PhD in computing science. So it, it's really going to depend on who you ask, but every one of them is important and, and true. And that's the fun part. And that's it? the fun part, yeah. So... I'm going to transition us to our sort of last section of the interview. I wanted to ask you the sort of, um, you know, how did this idea to create a Golisano archive come about? It's kind of a funny story. When I first started at the foundation, it was just the two of us, David Still and myself, and we had space in a small office near Eastview Mall. And I didn't have an office. I was at a desk in what you could say was the reception area. Tom had an office at the site that, that he used for non-paycheck business. So I wasn't going to sit in there. It wasn't my office. <laughs> but he kept telling me to sit in there. I said, I don't need to sit in there. I'm okay. I, need, I have a desk and a computer and a phone. That's, that's, and then I'm out in the field. So it's kind of like, you know, before we went into remote work, I was already doing remote, but didn't know it. At some point, I went into the office. And on the walls were memorabilia, awards, um, framed magazine covers, you know, entrepreneur of the decade, CEO of the year, five, six times in a row, Forbes magazine, Inc. magazine, um, The Economy. I, I, I mean, I knew Tom was important. I knew he had done wonderful things for paychecks and with paychecks. But as I sat around that office, I said, oh, my goodness, this man is, he's really something, and he's important to our region, and somehow we have to preserve it. Don't, it was like a st stroke of luck and lightning that just went off. At the same time, I noticed that he would get material, letters, information, and he'd throw it away. Pretty important stuff, I thought, for a legacy. So I told him, I said, just so you know, if you don't want me to see something, don't throw it in the wastebasket because I'm going through your wastebaskets because you are just throwing away recognitions and invitations and proclamations and, and everything else. And I didn't know about this world yet. It was just coming to this address that wasn't going to, because everything was a paycheck site. So I just started collecting. I didn't know anything about an archive. I didn't, at that time, know anything about um, what I would do with it. I just knew it shouldn't be in the waste paper basket. We moved our offices. I brought the boxes with me to the new office. And over time, Tom started to bring me material, maybe from his house. Like, oh, Ann, I've got some material from, you know, the early days of paychecks. Do you want it? Yes, I want it. So as time went on, we, we started to collect, and they literally... All the material was in a box, not organized, not cataloged, nothing. One day, his sister Marie walks in with boxes, these famous boxes. She was moving, and I happened to be up in the front reception area, and she said, Ann, I've got these boxes of material of Tom's legacy, work, 
accolades, awards, honors, speeches. And she said, I can't throw them out and I don't know what to do with them. And I said, I know what to do with them. I said, you're going to add it to my collection of boxes. I said, and what we do from there, I, it remains to be seen. However, it was that conversation. I said, I think it needs to be housed somewhere at a, at a library or something. And we named some of the universities that Tom was associated with. And Marie said let's let's think about this let's do it and i'm all in so i don't know if this is exactly how the story went at that time bill dessler was a trustee on the foundation board of director tom had significant involvement and contributions at rit with the two colleges he was a, on the a trustee at the time i don't think the hockey the Policini rink was um, up yet. But anyway, and I asked Bill, I don't think it was specific to would you take the collection, but what do you think about this idea and how, what do people do about this and how do we do it? And of course he was keen on it right from the get-go and I was connected to um, advancement or donor relations and, and then at the time the archivist to think about what this could be, how it could be. So it was really organic. It was really, um, I don't know why I thought I should save the stuff, but I did. I think about how much stuff wasn't saved, <laughs> but we won't go there. We have a lot and it's still growing because he's alive and he's still so active and doing many wonderful things. And how did that feel for you to go from these sort of salvages to a waste paper basket to the final archive in its unveiling? Well, obviously, I, I am I'm happy and pleased that it it's now where it needs to be and in the state it needs to be. Primarily, I'm glad for Tom and his family that his legacy is going to be preserved and RIT is the perfect place for it and we we couldn't be more pleased with the direction the archive is going and will continue to go as you and the RIT help us educate the community and the world on this this man this legacy this on all his transformational gifts and impact. So it's a it's a good feeling that it but I knew I know nothing about <laughs> just collect collect the boxes. I've learned a lot about archives and the potentials and things you do with it from you and your team at RIT and it's it's been a fascinating learning and journey. So it's all good. And what do you hope to see next? on the journey of the archives yeah well um i'm i like these um web-based exhibits and i like um how frequently the um display is going to be updated to keep him alive like we need younger students to know when they walk through the golisano school of computing science who he is and what the name means, not only to their education and future, but um, to RIT. So I, I feel good that it's receiving the attention it needs. I could have never articulated what to do in order to keep it alive, because it's certainly not my background in my field. I knew, I, I thought more, I wanted more to be done, but I didn't know what that was but now we have a, a a solid plan and a solid commitment and a wonderful new marie graham archivist that's taking this ball and running with it and i expect wonderful things thank you and i love that the students are all going to be involved from various divisions and departments yeah. so it's all good well, that concludes my list of questions for today. And is there anything else that you wanted to discuss that maybe we didn't touch on? 
had a thing. You covered a lot of ground here. I hope this was helpful. This, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome.